so, so last Tuesday, as you remember, we talked about the Sayers Museum, now the Makokota Caves State Park Visitor Center, right? That wonderful, wonderful little building. And we talked about how all of the Native American artifacts went to the Office of the Iowa Archaeologist, which was appropriate. But the other artifacts, a lot of them came to the Historical Society. And so during the week when I was over there, I was walking through and I was looking at what things do we have that came from the Sabres Museum. Let me tell you, there are many. Starting with the Spanish-American War Cannon that's out in front, everybody knows about the two-headed calf and the two-bodied lamb, I guess we call it. Um, when, when groups come to visit the museum over there, especially when they're school groups, the things that they're interested in, that they know are there before they come, are the two-headed calf and the lamb, they want to see that, and the murder case. <coughs> they want to see the murder case. Well, as you come in, you see, as you come into the museum, of course, you see the tribute to Jay Goodnow, the father of Makokota, and Allie Pearson, who's, who made it possible to build the Pearson building so that the Historical Society would have a home, and Judge Arthur Jensen and all of his things that are there, his desk, his trombone, all of his things. Ansel Brig, the first governor, and Millican, our most famous citizen. All of those things are there, but most importantly are the accomplishments of Professor, Professor J.W. Ellis. And the Ellis Museum, of course, played a very important part of our topic for today. The, the murder case came to us from the Sabres Museum. It, went to the, it got to the Sabres Museum because it had been in the Ellisonian Museum. So J.W. Ellis is the one that had had put this murder case together. It contained artifacts that he collected himself in person. Then when his museum closed, all of this went to the Sagers Museum and now to the Historical Society. So um, I went back to his to his research, Ellis's research, and those are the those are the things that we're going to use today because they're firsthand primary source things and so those are the most important. Maybe you remember that a few years ago, Ken Wright was doing wonderful brown bag lunches for us. It was pre-COVID days. And uh, he did three brown bag lunches almost in a row about murders that had taken place in Jackson County over the years. That many murders. Um, and so we, we have all of his research. And of course, his research was interesting because he had, he had access to court documents and other official records that maybe you and I don't have access to. And so he talked for, for three full hours about murders in our county. Well, J.W. Ellis, as you know, to... Okay, there's J.W. Ellis. As you know, he wrote the two-volume 1910 history of Jackson County, the one that we used so very much. And in his 1910 history, he wrote about the murder of D of A. D. Rowland. And he he was referred to as Deb. His nickname was Deb. He was Deb Rowland. Um, all of the accounts that, that are recorded about this event again came from Ellis. And so these are these are his words. This is this is what he said. On the morning of the 9th day of April, 1897, as Alfred Kinney was driving along the road leading from Makokota and Iron Hill to the Moorhead Bridge, at a point in the road almost in front of a small house <coughs> occupied by A.D. Rowland, he discovered a dead body of a man laying partly in the road with his head crushed and covered in blood. Mr. Kinney gave the alarm. And when some of the neighbors assembled, the body was recognized as that of A.D. Rowland. And Coroner Miller of Preston, and I couldn't find a picture of him. Do you have a picture of him, Don, do you know? He was, the, he was the coroner. He was from Preston, but the Jackson County coroner. And Sheriff Mitchell of Makokota were notified by telephone. Sheriff Mitchell was on the scene very, very soon. But the coroner who lived in... Preston had to drive some 25 miles, and the roads were very rough 
did not reach the scene of the tragedy until very late in the afternoon. And as you know, these are my words, as you know, until the coroner got there and cleared the scene, nothing could be touched, nothing could be moved. So they waited until late in the afternoon when he came. By then, a large crowd of excited neighbors searched around the premises all day. There were three terrible wounds on the head, one on the forehead near the temple, another on the left ear, and one on the jaw. It was evident from the wounds that they were made with a blunt instrument, and a search was made in every direction for the weapon. And the club was found by J.W. Ellis about 10 rods from where the body lay. And this is the club. Fresh blood and hair on the club left no doubt in the minds of anyone who saw it that it was the weapon with which the unfortunate man had been done to death. So, we think, they think, this was a stake from a wagon, right? It would have been, it would have been like this around this wagon. Okay, again, in, in Alice's words, Deb Rowland, as he was famili familiarly called, had lived alone in a two-room cabin on part of his father's land, about nine miles northwest of Makokoda. He was 34 years old and of inoffensive and peaceful nature. He was not known to have had any trouble with anyone, except a little trouble with regard to <coughs> trespassing stock. I don't, know what, I don't know what that means. During the summer, he had worked on a farm and in the winter, he had been chopping wood for a neighbor. On one side of his home, about 20 yards distant, in a southerly direction, was the home of George Moorhead and family. In the opposite direction, some 40 rods distant, on the same road lived John Slaughter and his family. And it was at his place that both Moorhead and Roland had been getting their supply of water because neither of them had a, had a well on their farm. The theory most popular at the time and from the appearance of the body when found and the presence of the tin pan <laughs> laying near the body was that the deceased had started off to the slaughter place to get some eggs, as was his custom, because he worked for slaughter and according to the evidence deduced, he was taking eggs in as part pay and this is the pan. <laughs> this is the pan that was found near his body. And this is the pan that they know he took every few days over and gathered eggs and took back to his house. So they found this pan near the body. They, and again in Alice's words, while on the way he had been waylaid and beaten to death with a club prepared for the purpose. So that's the end of the quote. Nothing had been taken from his pockets. They were still in his pockets, so it was not a robbery. He had two pocket knives, a pocket book with 25 cents in it, some keys, a silver watch, and a little diary book, all of which was given to his father. Since he had little, robbery was not an incentive. The body was dressed in cheap, everyday work clothes, and his cap laid about a foot from his head, the lining soaked in blood. So this was, this was his house where he lived. Um, what occurred, I wonder, when, once the body was, was discovered, like we said, body couldn't be touched until the coroner arrived. He got there from Preston around 5 p.m. And who were the main players? And I think we have another, this is another picture of the house, and there was a shed behind the house where he lived. So the, yeah. other than Allison and, and the neighbors that were, were milling around, whoops, I'm sorry, there's the inside of the shed that was on his house. So the first person of importance that, are, that arrived on the scene had been Sheriff Frank Mitchell. And the sheriff came early, What's right, right away, and he had been there all day. He had been tending to his duties. He had summoned three men 
to act as a coroner's jury, Hiram Stevenson, P.W. Tracy, and S.K. Ponsler. And he had subpoenaed several witnesses to the scene. Once the coroner arrived and took charge, the body was carried into Roland's little house that we just saw. The next important person was the undertaker, Henry Harrison. William Harrison of Harrison and Son Funeral Home, always called Henry, was the undertaker. He then took charge, removed the clothing, and washed the blood from the body so that the coroner could examine the wounds. So, like we said, Dr. Miller was the Jackson County coroner at the time. And we have no pictures of him, I'm sorry, that I have been able to find. Um, but he was assisted by Dr. Ristine. And we've, we've had a program lately about Dr. Ristine, if you remember. He was a physician from Iron Hill. Later, he moved his practice to Maquoketa. Um He helped examine, the two doctors examine the body to determine the cause of death. Um, the examination found four blows had been delivered to the head. And they are very graphically described in this article. So I'm going to do nothing but say that one crushed the cheekbone and it left a circular hole in his left cheekbone that resembled a gunshot wound. So the, cor the coroners had to probe this wound to be sure that it wasn't a gunshot wound. And they did that, and their conclusion, they all agreed that it was also made by a blunt instrument or club. They agreed that all of the wounds had been made by the bloody club that had been found. So after the autopsy was, autopsy was finished, the coroner's jury adjourned, and with the, the witnesses, they all went to the nearest schoolhouse, which was subdistrict number nine, Long World School on the Cage Road. It was also known as the Moorhead School. It was in the northwestern corner of South Fork Township. And it's interesting to me because so often when there is a catastrophe, they all gathered at the nearest schoolhouse. When the narrow gauge had its, its only fatal accident and went off that big curve, um, everybody went to the nearest schoolhouse, and that's where they took the wounded to the schoolhouse. So they went to Long Grove Schoolhouse. Most of you could probably remember that schoolhouse out on the Cave Road, only in later years it had red asphalt siding on it, and it was there for until not really many years ago it came down. Okay, in the meantime, as word spread, hundreds and hundreds of people had come to look around. By evening, they found what food there was to eat in the area because they couldn't go to McDonald's, right? Yeah. And they, uh, they too proceeded to the school, so, so just hundreds of people gathered at the school. The county attorney, and we don't know who the county attorney was, at least in the research that I've been able to do, the county attorney didn't show up until about 10 p.m. And in quizzing the witnesses that we said were called, a likely scenario was pieced together. Deb Rowland had returned from work about, and then about 7.30 or 8 o'clock, he had taken his pan and gone to get eggs. About that same time, George Moorhead had passed by Rowland's house on his way to water his horses at John Slaughter's well. Mr. Slaughter heard the horses and he said it sounded as though they had run into a brush pile near where the body was found, but he didn't go out and investigate. He did remember, as most people there knew, that the two men had been bad friends for some time, and the panel surmised that Moorhead suspected that Roland might be going to do him harm, so he grabbed a stake from a nearby wagon the words were exchanged, and then they came to blows. Okay, this is George Moorhead, the accused. The sheriff and the coroner then examined George Moorhead's clothing. And there were a great many tiny spots found on it that looked like blood. They were on the sleeves of his coat, and there was flesh, fresh blood on his pants. Alice reported that George Moorhead was then arrested, and he was charged with the murder of his neighbor, and the grand jury brought an indictment. 
finding that George Moorhead had feloniously, willfully, deliberately, and with malice aforethought, deprived of life so that, so that the said A.D. Rowland then and there died, contrary to and in violation of the law. There is our beautiful Jackson County Courthouse. It had it had been there very long before this trial took place. At the trial, <clears throat> Moorhead was defended by attorney D. A. Winecoop, R. W. Henry, Jackson County attorney, who we now know. R. W. Henry was a Jackson County attorney. He was the prosecutor, and Judge W. F. Brandon Brannon was the judge. <clears throat> He describes a hard-fought battle with the jury being dismissed after they were not able to reach a conclusion. So, I guess you call that a hung jury? They did not reach a conclusion. Judge A. J. House presided over the next trial, so they tried him again, where George Moorhead was found guilty of manslaughter and he was sentenced to 12 years at hard labor at Anamosa. But he was released for good behavior in just a little over seven years after being an, an exemplary prisoner. While he was in prison, he learned the cobbler's trade and he went to, and upon his release, he opened a small cobbler shop in Elwood and he worked there for several months. But at the end of several months, his health failed and he moved back with his family and he died about two years after his release from prison. During that time, he had always professed his innocence, claiming to know nothing about the crime, but Judge House had no doubt about his guilt. <coughs> so, about the victim. The deceased father was Isaac Rowland, and he had married a woman by the name of Mahala Meese in DeWitt. And eventually, they had att attained several small plots of land near the Makokota Caves, they had a few acres here and a few acres there, and they got that because he would harvest the timber and, and, and as, a, as a payment for harvesting all this timber, he'd be given a couple acres of land. So he had some small plots of land, and they built a log house, these, this couple built a log house for their four sons, John, Delbert, who is, was called Deb, the man who was killed, Alonzo and Emery, four boys. Later, Deb Rowland had married, so he had been married. <clears throat> his wife was dialed, his wife died in childbirth two and a half years late earlier. He had two little girls. The six-year-old was then living with his parents, and the baby was adopted out by a Mr. and Mrs. Van Baltenberg. Deb Rowland was buried next to his wife at Esgate Cemetery at a very, very large funeral. He had been very well liked, and the funeral was huge. About the defendant, George Moorhead, who was born in 1869 in Monmouth, Iowa, was the son of Alex Moorhead and Elizabeth Liston, and he was 21 years old when he married Addie Knight, who was 22. She doesn't hear me. Of course. There always are two sides to every story, and there are those, there were many who believed that George was guilty, and, just as, and many just as convinced that he was not. And maybe, as Ellis said, we mortals will never know for sure. But in reading the voluminous <coughs> accounts, there is one thing that stood out to this judge, and that's, and he said this, Judge House, were I on the jury, I could not put this aside. And that is how many times George Moorhead, the accused, had been reprimanded for mistreating his horses, for savagely beating his horses. He had been in trouble time after time after time. Deb Rowland and he had often had words in the past about how many times he had clubbed these poor animals. So that was the source of the friction between them. In describing this murder, the, Centra, the Jackson Sentinel reporter wrote, Truly we have lost a good neighbor and a citizen by as foul a murder as was ever committed in Jackson County. 
which has a reputation second to none in the state for such acts. Don's shaking his head, yes. We were a, a very violent, it was a very violent area. It was a rough and tumble, wild, wild west for a long time. But the sign that was with the original murder case in the Alberts <coughs> Museum said this. We ask that you do not think of Jackson County as a place of wild criminals. These things happen in all communities. Most of Jackson County is filled with wonderful people. So that's the story of Beverly. <coughs> and I'm just grateful that I'm just grateful that we were able to receive so many wonderful things from the Sagers Museum when it closed. Many, many things. So next time you're in the museum, I hope you'll look around because most of them are identified as coming from there. But just many, many things. So come in and take a look. Okay. Don't forget, next week will be <coughs> our, our program about the Ham House by Doris. Where was it? Okay, it was on the south. It was. It was south of. It was south of Ken Wright's office, right? It was in, in between. In between the present courthouse and the, and library. the library. Right. So that would be south of. Because yes. the county seat switched from Bellevue to Andrews and Goldberg. County seat switched many times. First it was in Bellevue, then it went to Andrew, then it went back to Bellevue, then it went back to Andrew, then Makoka had built a courthouse in three months and for a dollar gave it to the county so that the county seat would come here. Of course it all had to be voted on. The citizens voted it to all these places. But do you remember the date? 1873. Okay, so 1873 our courthouse open and this was in 1896 so hadn't been there for a very long time so any other questions what, where was the Ellison Museum at originally it was north there was the courthouse and there was my dad's office and then there was the Ellis Museum and then the library right okay. yeah, but we're talking about that's Frank Ellis's museum and she's absolutely right we're talking about J.W. Ellis and the earlier Allisonian Museum. And that was on Pleasant Street. Um, Dr. Young's office is there. Now. Okay, so oh, where the okay. Black the Birds and the office is. What did that dev do if he was coming home from work at like 7.30, 8 in the morning? Do you know that? No, he came home in the afternoon oh. and it was 7 or 8 at night when he went to gather eggs so for his dinner. So he might have been dead there for the next they found him the next morning. And then he was there all day. I'm thinking the evidence they walked on. Oh, I know. All the people that right as they waited in, and just you know, as word spread, more and more people came and, and just milled around. And it must have been quite a horrific, quite a horrific scene. So, any other questions? I do, Bonnie. If that uh, Moorhead was convicted. Why is there more head access? Why is there what? More head access to the river, Makokota River. He's asking why wasn't he canceled in today's vernacular? Why wasn't he canceled? Well, there were many more heads, for one thing. Okay. And he may not have been, and he probably wasn't part of that more head family. But I don't quite understand, and I didn't read probably far enough to know it. If I had read more of Ken Wright's, story about this. I don't understand why they had the hung jury because they couldn't come to a conclusion and then they retried him and A.J. House was the judge because I thought you couldn't try a person a second time for the same trial. They changed right. the charges. Is that what happened? So he first he was tried for first degree murder. They couldn't convict him on that. So then they lessened the charge and tried him again. And tried him again. Okay. But but it's it's just telling that probably the main reason that he was convicted was cruelty to his horses all those years. If people had not seen that in him, there may not have been enough proof to you know to convict him otherwise. So just very interesting how things and um, 
So, because he was convicted then on the lesser charge, is that why he wasn't done? Because since he was found guilty, isn't that the normal thing back then that they would have hung him? They would have hung him. Yeah. yeah. But they reduced the charge from murder to, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It is. It's back pretty interesting. Then, you think they would have. You know, made a big deal out of that. That's right. You know, Don has been, um, since he's down here, Don has been researching the hanging because because Dennis has said how many times the courthouse was in Andrew, the county seat was in Andrew. So everybody's heard about the hanging tree in Andrew. Well, Don has found three three different hanging trees at least. in Andrew. At least. And so it's just, after so many years, it's just hard to get to the bottom. You know, there's conflicting information and it's hard to get really get to the bottom of things. Yeah. But, but different hanging trees in Andrew. You should at some point please go over to the other museum and look at the murder case. There are artifacts from the Mini Kyle murder, lots of different murders that happened. There's pieces of the hanging rope, there's all kinds of things in the murder case over there. So it's uh, interesting to look at. So we're, we're happy to have it. All right, thank you very much.